All right, so I'm Anne Marie Rowe, one of the product owners for Folio, and thank you so much for everybody that's um, that's joining today. Uh, just our quick normal housekeeping at the beginning. Um, we moved the list of team members out of the slide deck, and uh, put uh, are now just referring to the uh, team spaces that we have on the wiki. But we do continue to have um, folks shifting around from one team to another, plus uh, several new developers that have joined in the last uh, last few weeks. Um, we are uh, we have three pages of teams at this point, um, and all of these folks have uh, spaces on the wiki. If you want to get additional information about particular uh, team makeups and, and details about those teams. And we've got links for those. Uh, this is my Bible as far as uh, the work and the releases for Folio. Um, the team module responsibility matrix, I think helps keep all of us organized on which team is responsible for releasing which uh, modules and also who the product owner is to contact if there's questions about any of that. As far as where we are, uh, we did a hot fix four for Iris uh, back uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, as far as Juniper, we uh, had a couple last minute glitches, but we finally got to general release for Juniper, yay, on 23rd of August. We will be having a hot fix release. Uh, it was decided, I think, yesterday. As far as I know, though, we don't have official dates for that hot fix release. Um, anybody from the cap planning team or anybody that, that knows anything more specific about the Juniper hot fix at this point? All right. I'm not hearing anybody speak up. Um, I know there are several JIRAs that are um, marked for it. And I would imagine we're gonna be getting the, the uh, date for it organized as soon as the uh, work is done. So I think we're hoping for sometime in the next few days. And then of course, most of our work is focused around Kiwi right now and we are fast approaching all kinds of deadlines for Kiwi. Just a reminder that after this uh, presentation is finished, it gets posted on YouTube and we're also linking to the demo and the slides that go with the demo um, in the Kiwi area. So that if you're looking for Kiwi work, you'll find the most recent sprint demos there as well. And we have our normal uh, highlights from each of the dev teams on what they've been doing in the last two releases. Sorry, the last two sprints, not releases. That you can peruse at your leisure. And now we get to demos. So our first demo is going to be from Thunderjet. Um, we don't have quite as long a list as we did last time where we had a supersized um, sprint review because we had four sprints worth of, of demos and, and work. Um, so we may finish this one a little bit earlier, but we're going to start with Thunderjet, the acquisition spokes. So Andre. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Hello. Let me share my screen. I believe you can see it. So I'm going to demonstrate um, shortcuts in inventory. It's uh, not something new. Most applications, uh, folio applications have this functionality, but now we have the same in inventory. So if we use uh, control alt key, we'll see. Oh, okay. We'll see um, keyboard uh, shortcuts model with uh, the list of uh, actions and uh, shortcuts uh, that we can use. Uh, 
So let's try to do something. So if we use uh, Alt N, we'll create new uh, instance. So uh, the same if we use uh, Control S, we can save it or just uh, press Escape uh, to cancel the form and close it. And uh, much more examples. Uh, if we want to clone our instance, we just uh, need to use the Control Alt C buttons. And the same, we'll see the cloned uh, instance that we can uh, save. Mm, and uh, what I want to demonstrate more, if we want to collapse or expand all accordions, we just need to use shortcuts keys and uh, its work is in other applications. So I think we can use it and uh, it's a very useful feature for those who use um, our Folio application. Thank you. And Andre, could you, yep. it, it, when you brought up the list of keyboard shortcuts, I think you used a shortcut to get to that list. Is that Control right? Alt key, right? Okay. And then can you just show how you can get to it from the menu up top? also okay in the left right left yeah. top uh, yeah you can click on inventory uh, app uh, icon and then click the menu and select uh, shortcuts awesome. key. thank you so it's great to have these i i know dennis ha has been uh, so excited to have them in the acquisitions areas where we have so so many um, creates and edits happening all the time. And it's great to see them in inventory now too. So thank you. Time saver. Time and frustration saver. Yes. Um, all right, how about Makita? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, let me share my screen. And I believe you can see it. Um, so I'd like to present our progress with uh, supporting holdings uh, in orders and receiving, like in total in acquisitions. Uh, it will contain some part of uh, previous demos, uh, but to, to show whole picture. Uh, so for this, I'll create a new order. Uh, uh, okay, and add uh, order line. Um, just select required uh, settings. And previously, we demonstrated in orders uh, that we can select holding or create. Um, New holding for location, uh, and let's let it be popular region collection. Uh, we don't have uh, such holding or selected uh, instance. Let's define its quantity and just update some other settings and just save uh, this order line. Uh, so we can see uh, that we have a uh, location selected for this clear line and let it open. Uh, okay, order has been opened. And in our case, location uh, became uh, holding. So we created new holding for selected location. And now let's go to uh, receiving um, and before I'll just mark uh, my PLA, PLA line with... so here we have title for previously created order line and here we see 
piece that we uh, that was autom automatically created uh, by opening order and here we have field like select location similar to previous one like uh, we used on orders and uh, we support the same functionality to create holdings for locations additionally we added two more fields enumeration and chronology plus uh, display and holding uh, to to show receiving history in inventory application i'll show you uh, a bit later like um, at the final stage uh, so for now i'll just add enumeration uh, and uh, set up the flag to update my piece and let's receive it uh, so yeah i'll keep um, my holding uh, for receiving and just receive this um, piece and let's go to inventory application um, so now you can see that we have popular reading collection uh, holding And additionally, in receiving history, uh, we have our um, piece that uh, we've received. Additionally, um, we connected uh, this holding to um, create it PL line, and we displayed it under acquisition accordion. And I'll show one more example, uh, but with um, manual uh, flow. So I'll duplicate. Uh, this order uh, but uh, order line will be like will support manually at pieces uh, and I'll select um, annex for example um, actually for manual creation it's not required to be opened so we can move to receiving um, and uh, title that um, has been created for our order line and we don't have any pieces uh, here so we just added um, same situation we have a list of um, our um, Holdings and additionally, we don't have item created for uh, our piece. So let's create item and uh, fill enumeration and chronology. And when we save a piece, item is created plus it's connected to holding that we selected. Uh, and let's back to our title and do receiving for this piece uh, and again let's back to inventory um, so now for annex and here we see like some uh, this piece was created for another uh, order, like for testing previously. So um, for now, you can see that we received in, in, for this holding one more piece. And we have uh, several connected uh, order lines. And I think that's it from my part. Um, do you have any questions? I don't have questions, but I love, 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 love this. And and I, I want the acquisitions accordion and the instance and the items that it's associated with too, but really nice piece of work there. Thank you. All right. So next up is Spitfire with Dennis. Um, yep, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, just a second. Um, 
So you probably see it, right? Yes. <clears throat> Great. Um, yeah, so uh, Spitfire team has been working on uh, some improvements to uh, searching functionality in a holdings application. And uh, we've been writing tests, uh, RTL and just tests to cover uh, holdings application as well. Um, and today I'll show you the, um, the search improvements. So we've made some changes to um, how um, search results are displayed. Um, yeah. So for example, um, if I search for EPSCO, um, you can see that um, we have previous and next uh, buttons to um, sort of go through the results. Um, and I can show that better, I think, uh, with uh, more uh, results. So we have implemented this for providers, uh, packages, and titles. Um, so if I search for EPSCO here, you can see that um, we are showing um, 100 items per page and you can um, switch to the next page um, and see the next, uh, in this case, it's only 17 items, but uh, yeah, you can um, go through these um, results page by page. Um, yeah, and the same in uh, titles as well. Um, and also we have implemented uh, this functionality in uh, provider's um, show page to um, also go through uh, packages in this provider. Um, so you can see that at the bottom of the list, uh, we have um, also previous and next buttons uh, and they, uh, also uh, help you like navigate through through this uh, large list and uh, mm, let's go to a package that has uh, a large amount of um, titles as well um, yeah and the same uh, is applied in uh, titles list mm, yeah and um, that's um, i think that's all for me um, well, it's just uh, Spitfire changes. Um, yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dennis. And Firebird, we've got three folks. So we'll start with Ilya. Hello, hello everyone. Let me show my screen. Uh, so, uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay, so uh, in the past work, uh, we have uh, uh, we added the uh, handling of uh, mark records that uh, exceeds the its max uh, its max size uh, when we export uh, instances with a great number of items. So in advance, I uh, uh, imported to the system uh, two instances, and uh, first one uh, contains uh, 100 items, and uh, another one contains uh, uh, 10 items. Uh, so uh, as well, uh, I created uh, a special uh, mapping profile, which uh, consists from uh, a great number of transformations in order to uh, get uh, the required size of record uh, with this number of instances. So let's just uh, uh, go to the export tab and try to export uh, first uh, instance. So first, first instance contains uh, 100 items and the outcome record uh, would be, um, will be about uh, 160 thousands characters, which is uh, huge to be uh, exported. So let's select the file and uh, select our uh, mapping job profile that I created for this demo. So let's wait a bit while uh, the system will uh, try to export in this particular instance. This is when we need the whole Take music. The
So uh, we see that uh, the uh, status of the job uh, is fail and it is correct because we have just single instance which cannot be exported. And uh, if we will click on this tab, uh, we will go to the uh, error logs page and we will see the uh, error log that is uh, that relates to a particular instance and we see the uh, error message here as well we can see the uh, id of the instance that uh, uh, wasn't converted uh, wasn't exported to the uh, from the system uh, as well we see the char id title and as well we go to, we can navigate to the instance via the uh, special link to this instance Now we see that it is really uh, our instance with uh, 100 items. So let's try another case and uh, just verify the uh, correct status of the job profile, of the job execution. So let's import uh, a file which, uh, include, which includes uh, one valid instance with 10 items and one invalid instance with 100 items. And let's select the same job profile. So let's wait a bit. So, and we see that uh, status for now is uh, completed with errors and uh, we still have a chance to uh, see the error logs and to define the instance which uh, uh, that uh, lead to the uh, error. As well, we are able to uh, download the uh, valid instance, uh, I mean, uh, mark file that was converted uh, from uh, valid instance. So we can open it and we can see that, yes, there is the contact content of this file. Let's close it. So uh, I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ilya. So if if one out of a hundred records in my export is too large, then I would get the file of 99 and I would get the error for the one. Is that right? Yeah. Perfect. That's really nice. Okay, thank you. All right. And Alexi Harbos. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I think Ilya should stop Ilya, sharing. I think you, yes, I think you need to stop sharing, Ilya. Sorry. No worries. Okay, now you should be able. Nope. Uh, do you see it? Yes. Okay. Mm. Oh. I'm going to show you the improvements that we have done for fail uh, jobs for data export. Uh, previously, the end of the previously the date of the end for failed jobs was way incorrect. So I have prepared a special file. We should fail for export. So uh, not to wait until the periodical job um, completed, I'll do it manually. So this one, and um, here you see that the date of completion was populated correctly. And now all failed jobs are in some order. So, and that's all from my side. So this fixes that situation where the failed jobs kept incrementing to the current time and stayed up at yeah, the top of the yes, log. Is yes, the old time was at, at the up of the list. Yep, that's great. 
um, definitely will be helpful. It was always a pain and bug fest when you're trying to find your most recent export and you've got all the errors at top. All right, and uh, last for Firebird is Vlad. Yeah, so hi everyone, and I will share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see it. Yes. Yeah, and first of all, that I will demo would be uh, fixing some validation stuff in uh, creating a mapping profile. And previously, uh, we have uh, possibility to save um, mapping files without some transformations against to selected uh, whole uh, record types. And now if we don't add any transformations, we see this validation error. And actually if we add some transformation and we try to save it and yeah, we have seen a success message and only one case <laughs> Uh, there are only one case when we can save uh, our mapping file without any transformations is when we uh, choose source record uh, storage. And let's try. And yeah, for this case, it actually works as expected. And second one story is about um, ordering this mapping profile's names in this drop down when we trying to uh, create new drop profile and here you can see that it's uh, ordered alphabetically and i think it would be pretty helpful if there would be a big list to find needed mapping file uh, actually that's it from my side all right thank you vlad always good to see these little bits of cleanup to make things easier. All right, so next we have Vega with Alexander. Everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I will share my screen. Tell me when you see it. Yes, we see it. Okay, cool. So Historically, our team has been doing a lot of work related to patron notices, which are notoriously hard to troubleshoot. Um, the logic of this subsystem is rather complicated and each email passes through a whole chain of modules on its way towards uh, the patron's mailbox. Uh, debugging them usually involves digging through a ton of logs, which is tedious and time consuming. So in order to improve the situation and make errors, related to emails a bit more visible. We have implemented a new error handling mechanism, which captures this, uh, these errors and sends them to circulation log. So now if you go to circulation log and expand this notice section, uh, along with um, uh, the usual filter for patron notices, you will see this new checkbox, which, has, which says send error. And if you click it, you will see all the uh, patron notice related errors uh, captured by our system. Now, these new records, they're pretty much identical to the old ones, except for the new circ action and uh, the error message, which each of these records has. Um, this error message usually tells you what exactly went wrong, along with um, adding some uh, additional technical info, which uh, will make debugging of these issues um, hopefully a little bit more efficient. And um, let's take a look at some of these records. Like this one says that the referenced item wasn't found. It means that um, the item referenced by a checkout notice does not exist in the system, which is uh, a common case. And this one, for example, again, the item wasn't found. Another one for an error returned by a um, downstream module down the call chain and um, so on. Well, uh, this approach that we used, it does have uh, some inherent limitations. 
like for example when you look through the patron notice errors you will see some um, cells without uh, any values and this is okay since uh, some of the errors might result in some of the data required for this table not being available like for example here an item record wasn't found which means that we were unable to figure out the item barcode or for this one for example the user wasn't found which again means that we uh, couldn't find the user barcode but uh, these um, unfortunate people they're usually easily worked uh, uh, around by using a combination of filters like for example one might look for errors related to a specific user or if the user uh, barcode is unavailable we can use the item barcode and so on um, there are also so, some smaller improvements like for example um, individual handling of loans within multi-loan notices um, such as checkout and check-in notices or overnight scheduled due date notices like for example these three um, notices should have been sent as a single notice um, to the same user but two of these loans were broken one didn't have a proper user link another one didn't have a proper loan reference and uh, so instead of failing the whole notice altogether we send the notice for one valid loan and uh, record it and uh, error into the circulation log now all of this works for notices produced by and processed by mode circulation both scheduled and immediate notices are supported at this point and uh, at the moment we are implementing implementing similar functionality for fees fines which will make things will take things um, a step further and uh, we'll send notices even if some non-essential data is missing. So it might send the notice with some token values missing and uh, at the same time log uh, an error into circulation log, uh, giving the hint about why those values might be missing. Uh, hopefully this functionality will make troubleshooting of patron notices a little bit easier for both uh, developers and uh, users. Um, this is still work in progress, but it, I think it's another small step forward towards a more robust and uh, user-friendly system. Um, that's all I got. Thank you. And yes, that is one of the biggest challenges, it seems like now, as more and more libraries implement, is when something goes wrong, figuring out where it went wrong. So anything that we can do to make it more visible is great. So thank you very much. Um, there was a question in chat. Why would the reference to a recently checked out item be incorrect and the item couldn't be found? Okay, the, sure if you know. the, the, yeah, this uh, is one of the more unlikely cases, but still it is technically possible. So we had to take precautions to make sure that even those unlikely errors would be uh, taken care of and locked properly. Great, thank you. And uh, on a more technical side, um, those patron notices, they are not sent immediately. They are saved in, uh, in the database as patron action sessions. And um, in order to delay their sending uh, so that we are able to group those notices by patron instead of sending uh, an individual notice for each single lawn. So, in a time while those uh, patron action sessions are sitting in the database, uh, the loan can be changed, can be deleted, an item can be altered or deleted, anything might happen. So again, we just wanted to take precautions. Thank you. Very Thank good. you for the Thank question you. mark. All right, and on Falcon, one of the former rock stars of Folijet, Alexei Kuzmanov. Hello, everyone. So let me share my screen. All 
Okay, do you see it? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so Falcon team, uh, a little bit extend uh, search possibilities uh, uh, for um, searching uh, instances. And uh, we extend uh, possibility to search by holding identifiers, uh, by um, item identifiers. And also now we can search by uh, items circulation nodes. So uh, let me share and present how it works. Uh, so uh, I prepared um, one instance with uh, uh, one holding uh, item. Uh, it contains uh, a former holding ID and uh, uh, human readable ID for holding. Uh, so now we can uh, find uh, we can find this instance and uh, by related holding by uh, holding identifiers uh, alias for search. Uh, so I I'll uh, share it in uh, Postman. Uh, so we can um, put uh, our alias for identifiers and uh, for example, use a uh, former holding ID. Um, and yeah, we can find our Falcon test instance uh, by uh, holding uh, former ID and it also works for uh, search by human readable ID. So it is uh, one alias for two fields. Yeah, we also can find a Falcon test instance. Uh, the same uh, thing also uh, was added for items. So, uh, but uh, for items, uh, we support um, search by three fields. It is a human readable ID, former identifier, and accession number. Uh, for search by items, uh, item identifiers, we should use uh, uh, item identifiers uh, search field. Uh, so we can uh, try to find by accession number. Yep, we can find our amazing Falcon test uh, instance with all related data. Uh, and it uh, works in the same way for other fields. So if we try to find by item identifiers, it search uh, through uh, three uh, fields of item. Yeah, uh, it works for former. Uh, uh, identifier and should work for uh, human readable ID as well. Yep. So we can find uh, uh, our instance by related uh, items uh, human readable ID. Uh, also, uh, for now we can uh, do search by uh, circulation nodes. Uh, for this purpose, uh, we have uh, a uh, specific search pass. So it is an item, a circulation nodes node. Uh, we can uh, try to find this instance by items uh, circulation node. And it also works. So uh, all documentation and um, uh, these examples uh, are present on uh, GitHub page for mod search. So uh, if you have uh, any questions, please ask me. It looks really good. Um, and I don't know if Charlotte's on. I don't see her. Um, I, we have a page of um, query construction in the inventory tips and tricks. So hopefully these are going to get added to, to that as well. Um, but it's great to see. And I think for all of us who are uh, waiting anxiously for Elasticsearch to uh, really become the main search for inventory, um, it's awesome to see these updates. Yeah, thank you very much. 
All right, and next we have Folajet, which I'll, I'll mostly just introduce really quickly. Um, we've been working on so much infrastructure and never ending tests, tests, and more tests. And did I mention tests? So um, not so much exciting to show on that front right now, but we did fix um, an annoying little bug that Velodia is gonna show that uh, Cornell reported. And then Yvonne, our UI lead, is going to show some of the work we've been doing with the big test just migration. So, Velodia. Yeah, hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. So, uh, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so today I want to demonstrate your fix about calculating date when uh, near the day boundary. Uh, so the main issue was that uh, when there are uh, today values set in mapping profile for the catalog date, uh, data import calculates it invalid and it didn't process time zone for tenant. Uh, so now uh, the team retrieves tenants time zone and calculates date uh, based on it uh, time zone. So uh, let me demonstrate it. So uh, we have, uh, I created job profile uh, with specific action profile and mapping profile for create instance with catalog date today. Uh, today is a keyword with the symbols for our data imports like syntaxes, uh, syntax uh, to you know, retrieve a current date for tenant. So um, I already uh, imported a simple file with one record via this specific job profile. And uh, let's see what we have. So uh, there was created a specific instance with catalog date for 31 of, of August. So if you, if you check, uh, it's current time for you to see. It was uh, set by default for our current tenant time zone. So yeah, it's uh, 31 of August, but let's uh, change time zone for for example uh pacific kiritimati uh, you know this is an island in the pacific ocean uh, near australia so and now uh they're already uh the first of september so this is current times here and now uh let's uh, make data import with the same file and the same job profile with today date. So we choose job profile with today catalog date for instance, and let's import it. Um, just a couple of seconds. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so we can see current time. Let's retrieve uh, instance human readable ID. <clears throat> yeah, we can see that SRS mark beep and instance were successfully created. Let's find uh, our instance. So this is our instance. And now we can see that catalog date changed to the 1st of September. So, and uh, when we, for example, change uh, UTC or some uh, other time zone, which will be uh, the 31 of August, it will show us and the import will show us the 31 of, of August. So yeah, basically that's it. If you have some question, please contact me in Slack, for example. Thank you. Thanks, Belodia, and thanks for putting snapshot load back to the regular time zone. Um, and um, Yvonne. 
Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Hope you can see. Yes. So, uh, yeah, today I want to share out uh, our progress in scope of unit test integration activity, which basically is our main UI activity for the current release. Uh, so, yeah, on this page, uh, we can observe test report for whole data import model. As you can see, there are a lot of components uh, in scope of our model, which should be covered with test at least at 18 percentage uh, level. And I want to mention uh, that we made a pretty good progress at this point. Uh, almost half of components already been covered uh, with test at sufficient level. And let me share some statistic with us. Uh, so uh, yeah, currently, as you can see, currently more than 300 tests have been implemented and actually we're going to proceed with this activity further. Um, Moreover, besides unit tests, uh, we've been working uh, we, uh, working on planning and outlining end-to-end uh, -end tests with our quality assurance engineer. And uh, also we have started end-to-end -end, uh, karate tests uh, for the end part. Um, more about those activity as the next screen demo. Actually, so far that's it from my side, thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. And yes, we've been doing so much with tests. We were trying to figure out a way to get a little bit of an update into the uh, sprint review. All right, let's see. Um, all right, Peter and Masood for Knowledgeware. Yes, uh, thank you. As Masood is uh, getting his screen share up, uh, I wanted to um, introduce this work. Uh, uh, coming uh, from internationalization. Um, I wanted to preface this by saying that we're breaking the rules a little bit because what we're showing is not on folio snapshot. Um, it requires changes to stripes and we didn't get those changes into the freeze date uh, last Friday for stripes or copy and RMB. Uh, so we are targeting the Lotus release uh, for the translation app. Um, I thought it was important to present here, though, because there is some minimal work that Stripe developers will need to do in order to enable this uh, translation app functionality. Uh, and so we wanted to get it uh, introduced earlier uh, and we'll have more details on the required changes later. Uh, so uh, Masood, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everyone <clears throat> here from across the Atlantic and in the Middle East. So I would say hello in behalf of everybody really appreciating the work you do and We've been doing since about two years ago with Folio or three years ago. We do appreciate it. Our contribution actually here uh, started from a real need that we, we have to deliver uh, to the market here uh, with, with Folio, which is bilingualities, at least two language support. And uh, just going back to the way things are done with Folio so far, I would like it maybe showing you some uh, right now with, with the folio, for instance, if you want to switch to another language uh, quickly with developer, basically you have to go to on a session level and you have to go and check out uh, the session locale. And you can see the process that just to switch to another language is not very encouraging because you have to kill whatever you've been doing. You have to exit from your application that's first of all, and then you have to go through so many steps to move until you get to the language you want. That's something we thought it's very uh, uh, cumbersome for a lot of people. So we thought we want to move from the developer, the, the session based uh, language switcher to a user level language switcher. And without that is necessary uh, here, as you see with, uh, with our implementation for the language switcher, uh, I can go and switch 
to any language on anywhere on anywhere on the screen. I could be in the middle of uh, of users, for instance, and all of a sudden I would like to go to go see it in another language, say Arabic. I should be able to do that, and you will notice also the users, groups, names start to appear in the language I'm standing in. So actually, we are heading in another uh, front that a challenge with for you that is made very singular language. Why? Because uh, for you, basically, uh, if you go at inventory, for instance, and you can see that all of the control vocabularies, uh, some of them coming from Labor Congress, some coming from others, that all of them are in a, in a language. So if you want to see that in another language, you basically have to overwrite of all of these description in the resource types. But that is not a uh, necessary, uh, very encouraging in countries like in the Middle East, you have to have Arabic and English. Somewhere in Canada, for instance, in the same system, you have to provide French and English. So you, no, no, you cannot do it in a single language. You have to provide the means, which is a shortage in the infrastructure of Foley actually, as far as the control vocabularies or as far as the, uh, the user uh, library defined policies. Like what? Like for instance, if you want to go to, here is uh, the tenant, you have statutes, campuses, libraries, location, and all of these could be in one single language. But what if I switch the screen to the other language? Would I be able to see it? Yes, you can. That's the implementation we had done. So we enable you to see the name of the, uh, the campus as well as, if you allow me, Dara, as well as the, the locations, as well as the, the users, and so on. So basically, we have uh, four stakeholders here we need to help to help out. Uh, before I'm, I'm moving this, like, here with the, with, the, with the language switcher, we made it easier also for everybody as a user level to customize the language switching story the way they like it. Like what? Like, for instance, here, if I go to uh, English, I'm giving the, we are giving the, the tenant administrator, basically, the mechanism to limit uh, languages. For instance, here, uh, I'm going to a tenant, and I'm giving them the privilege that I would like to select. I don't want to have all these languages that Folio supports, which is probably 26. Me as administrator, can I control just only the language that I feel like are necessary for, for my library environment? Here, I can select and delete whatever you want to make available, as well as selecting your tenant default language. So with the new users coming in without having setting their own language, what is the default language they see? The same thing with time zone, the same thing with uh, the currency and the timeout, and also uh, the primary language, which I will show you in the, in the, in the, in the settings for your uh, policy. Okay, this is for the tenant administrator. What about the user themselves? We are also given the user uh, the privilege to go and select the language that he or she feels like they only need to see. If they don't understand Chinese or they don't understand German, why should they have to, to see it again and again and again? I can simply just go and do the languages I want, even one single language, that's all what I need. Okay, so the user have that privilege to set up their languages that they want to switch in between which is uh, something we found to be, from experience, very, very important. As well as my preferred language. I want to se select a language that every time I log in, I should be able to see that language. Why you will have to go to English first, like with, uh, currently with Fodio, and then switch to another language, as you, and you saw it's a long process to switch to another language. I just want to see one, my own preferred language all the time, so I don't have to be concerned about switching again or again. The same thing with numbers. Here, an issue with uh, numerals. Uh, probably some of, them came across, come, some of you come across multilingual, multi-numeral shapes. Uh, with Arabic, we have the Hindu shapes and the Arabic shapes. So some people, they don't want to see the Hindu numbers shape. Some people, they want to see it all the time because it's some ho holy religious type of shapes that they have to relate to. The same thing with your, uh, your default date format, which is, this is an issue we found with Arabic because the React Intel forces you to use certain date format, which is something annoying sometimes because 
some people like to select the proper you know date format as they like to same thing we face with the circulation we found a couple of challenging cases with with, with checkout check-in the time format for anything that is not english is always forced to be 24. so we thought no we have to interfere here with moments to allow people to select the 12 uh, in the 12 hours okay so that's as far as a language switcher now what about what about now if we want to go to see the the infantry here all these uh, tables or instant that relate to the, the inventory uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, like here the source type they are a single language so if I want to use the inventory application in my own language should be able to have all these descriptive for the control vocabularies in the language I like to look here I'm adding a new instant and here everything looking for for the resource type is in English now, if, if I happen to be one to work in Arabic, should I be able to see all the, you know, the tables in the language I choose? That's the addition of the dynamic translation that we knowledge where have added to Folio uh, at the, the back end and the front end. If I want to go to, for instance, to, to Chinese, I should be able to see all the tables in English, the same thing. We are, you know, basically providing support for almost all languages on the fly to be able to see, uh, you know, their table. The same thing as I mentioned earlier here, like for instance, in Arabic, uh, the the users. Okay, uh, I didn't save the instance. Here we see that all of the you know user uh, user groups are upcoming in Arabic. If I go to to see it in, uh, if I switch to English, I should be able to see the group, the patron groups as, as well as English. Great. Now, what else? We What we wanted really to do, the mission we at Knowledge Wear thought we want to complement your work, your guys' work, and the wonderful work you did with Folio. We want to take it further in making Folio a language agnostic, so to speak. I mean, the guys in development had done a good job in making the, you know, supporting multiple languages. But as far as far as control vocabularies, as I showed you here, with the, with the, with the control vocabularies, with all the applications, all the user defined policy, as you can see that it's a singular language, you can have it only in one language. So we added our dynamic uh, translation now. Okay, let's, let's go see this users, and I wanted to, to, to be able to, what about documentation? This is part of really the challenge of making Folio a language agnostic. What we did, we actually we used a platform, open source platform called Wiki.js. Uh, and what we did basically, uh, we built the, the, trans, the translation apps on this Wiki because it's a true multilingual. Uh, maybe this is something in you, Peter, we haven't seen it before. So in case, you know, if I'm in the Arabic mode or French mode, I want to be able to go and see the documentation in my own language. Why have to deal with it in only in English? The same thing with the French, the same thing with any other language. So this is another uh, addition or enhancement we are doing to, en to enable users to be able to use Folio in their own native language. So, so to speak, breaking the barriers toward making Folio a language agnostic platform. Another approach also we have implemented is the few find which is the opac for the folio as you all guys know only eds and few find and maybe blacklight is the only inter interface for patrons so what we did we built the api levels at in the few find driver to be able to select so if i'm gonna uh, you know to, to be to fetch in our translation in folio so i'm, I'm searching here directly for everything if it's working, okay. I don't know. Let's see. Okay, uh, so here I'm I'm searching in the English interface, and I'm looking at this item title. Okay, and as you see here, I mean all the status for the the, the copies of this title coming in English. Now, what, what what about if I switch that to Arabic? What happens? I should be able to see the status in Arabic. If I want to do that in, in French, for instance. Okay, and actually what we do through API, we ask in Folio 
to kindly send us the translation for the item status on the fly as a, a dynamic API, because these translations are made actually part of Folio in the translation app. And here we go, we are gonna, with, I want to introduce the, the application app uh, we have developed for Folio. Uh, okay, let's go to English interface. Uh, with the with the translation app, which is our first application with it, uh, and our experience really with uh, with Folio has opened our appetite that we want to add more applications coming. One of them is manuscript for a customer that is interested in also an oral history application. We also bring in, in the content management system Strabi, which is a headless CMS coming soon to be part of Folio, Folio interface. So people in any organization that could use all the functionality staff functions, they can create content management you know, uh, task from within Folio. That's really the dream we wanted to make available. Anyhow, the application, the application, the translation application can allow, you know, give you a dynamic translation for whatever you like. For instance, here, library policy, I can select whatever, like here, the inventory, and all the translate, okay, I'm sorry, the tables that are under folio for the apps, I can, for instance, mode of instance, and I will give you the process. This is the, the process or the application used to translate or uh, control vocabularies or actually, uh, for that matter, for instance, uh, if you go to the user app, uh, the, okay, the, ten, the user app where we see, we want to see the, uh, the, the patron groups, for instance, here I can see it in Arabic on the fly, whatever I can add, I can switch the language for another language, for instance, uh, okay, German, maybe Italian, okay, Spanish. I should be able to translate it to Spanish to Chinese. So we are providing a dynamic translation engine for Folio to be able to translate whatever you as a library wish to define as part of your services through uh, the locations, through the library names, through the campus names, through the user groups names, and what have you. Uh, I think that's it for, for me for just giving you a brief introduction of how we are going to make or our contribution to make for you a true language agnostic platform. Thank you. Uh, Holy yeah. moly. It is Thank amazing. Thank you, Masood. Um, there is some stuff there that uh, you hadn't shown me before. So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, always you. good to see. Uh, I just wanted to, to reiterate that this is, is not coming for Kiwi. This is a, 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 a early preview. Uh, we are targeting Lotus. Um, and Stripe's apps will need to uh, make some changes in order for the dynamic translation to happen. And uh, we'll get that documentation out uh, early in the process of uh, working on Lotus. Wow, that that is like so exciting. Um, user level settings, all of the translation work, it's really impressive. And Masood, Thanks. I know you've Thank been you. in the community for a long time, but yes. we, we haven't heard you very often. So it's great to hear you also. Um, thank you. And thank you, Peter. Uh, I want to mention like, Atiyah, by the way, if you allow me, Anne. Atiyah is with us also. He's really the, the, the brain behind all this work. Atiyah Sharif from Egypt. Uh, he, he's also with us in, in this meeting, and I want to tell him thank you in behalf of all yes. the Arabic community here. Inshallah. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, if I lost my train of thought, what was it? Oh, Peter, Sorry. for the for the stripes updates, um, if you can provide guidance, or if there's um, like sample stories that you can create that we can clone for all of us that are going to need to do Stripe's work in Lotus. Um, the sooner we can know about that, it would be great. Um, but this, it just looks fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. Yeah, we still have some process to go through um, uh, having the uh, the changes to uh, Stripe's itself um, reviewed and included and uh, documentation and so forth. So, yeah, apologies for for uh, breaking the rules. This is not on Folio Snapshot. Uh, it's not coming for Kiwi, but we did want people to see it to know that it is coming. 
Right. And um, one other question, the the environment that Masood was working in, is, is that an environment or is there a, a community accessible environment where we can play with it or not yet? Don't ask. Uh, Masood, I think um, one of the, the folio tickets has the login information. Yes, yes, yes. Do you yeah, remember which one that is off the top of your head? Uh, actually, we made it available and available in all uh, issues we have contributed to make sure it, people can access it with the user and password. Uh, I think uh, from the beginning, uh, I mean, almost all of them, they have the, the URL to access. But if you want us to, uh, to um, if you, I would be happy if you want to put it uh, as part of the yeah. wiki, if you like. Uh, that would it's, be wonderful. Uh, yeah, UXprod uh, 3148 will get you the login information. Yes. UXprod 3148. Okay. UXprod 3148. Thank you very much. All right. And last but certainly not least, we have the king of tests and quality, Anton. Hi, everyone. Well, uh, I think king title is over exaggerated. Uh, I'm just trying uh, trying to help everyone to, uh, to make this project um, better or even best best around. So I uh, want to share some uh, good uh, good news or good results. Uh, let me set the um, deck into the presentation uh, presentation mode. Um, here we go. So um, as you know, we finished Bugfest and Juniper releases out and I just uh, would like to uh, congratulate all engineers that um, we did much better this time in terms of how many defects we generated and how smoothly this, uh, this release went. Uh, so on this slide, it shows just two releases right after testing is finished. At the bottom is Iris and at the top is Juniper. So you can see that we had uh, practically uh, half of the uh, half the number of failed test cases. So overall, just uh, state uh, state of the project after two weeks of testing without before the bug fix time started, uh, the code was much more solid and more test cases uh, did pass then. And this is the final result of the manual test run. Uh, again, at the bottom is uh, Iris and at the top is Juniper. So we had 50% um, less of the uh, test cases and, uh, uh, and uh, bugs related to those test cases deferred to the, uh, to the next release. So it's Basically, we cut down in half, and the passing rate, as you can see, is high. It's uh, 98 versus 96 percent. So, kudos to all your hard work, guys. Uh, the number numbers look so much better. Uh, getting close to uh, getting close to perfect, and. Um, well, I hope we'll keep up the good work for Kiwi, and we'll see same numbers for uh, Kiwi as well. And this is just a breakdown by the, uh, just gives you perspective of uh, across four releases. So it's like uh, uh, one year worth of uh, worth of bug fests here. And uh, a year ago, we only had 93% uh, passing rate. And now we have 98% of passing rate. So I think we, we're moving into the into right direction. So just if we build more automated test cases for the faster feedback and being able to catch bugs early in the cycle, that would be important. And if we can keep this trend going, it would be absolutely spectacular. So in terms of... Uh, Bug, uh, bugs that has been found during bug fest. So 
This is the number of bugs that uh, community testers uh, found. So because of their, uh, their work, we, uh, we uh, found 78 defects and it uh, represents 45% decrease, which is awesome compared to Iris when we found 139 defects. And overall issues that we had to fix for Juniper is 187 versus 313. So again, down 43%. So the time that we saved on fixing bugs, I hope it went into the new features and it went into the building testing infrastructure. So the fewer bugs we have, the more time we have to spend on something else. And uh, we did, a, uh, well, uh, the trend looks good. Let's see if we can uh, kind of match or even improve, uh, improve this number uh, for Kiwi. Uh, and this is um, the subject change. So this is the uh, overall uh, status uh, status page uh, status numbers for the uh, QA tracks. So on the left it's RTL uh, just this is your unit tests. In the middle is uh, Karate API backend uh, backend tests, and on the right is end to end tests. Uh, total percentage of uh, work completed for these tracks. It's not really specific. So. Uh, as you can see, we're half the way through with um, uh, RTL JS conversion and uh, IPI, uh, uh, IPI karate tests and end-to-end uh, -end tests are, is, uh, well, because we need to finish uh, unit tests first before we switch to end-to-end -end tests. So this is why it's not progress because of the prior, uh, priority preference, uh, we're not, uh, this work is not progressing as fast. And at the bottom, I have a link of updated folio, uh, folio quality dashboard. So you can go to that link and see more uh, uh, results in uh, greater details. There are more charts there uh, for each track uh, that shows what's been planned for each release and the progress on each release for each team so that you can go and check it out. It's uh, so that page has been updated. And the last thing I want to mention, just one uh, action item on your end. It's a reminder to uh, go in and clean up uh, defects that are over 12 months old. At the bottom, you can see the link to the to this dashboard. So if you go to the dashboard and scroll all the way to the bottom, you get the widget that you see now. And it's not a lot of bugs, it's a good sign. Uh, so it's only 30 bucks, but uh, I encourage you guys to go and review them and see if you can just dismiss them because they've been, uh, open for way too long and probably uh, out of context now. And for the extra credit, you can get rid of the bugs that are nine months old. There is a widget. Uh, uh, so there is a widget for every three months. Um, so uh, so uh, for uh, 90 days, uh, uh, then 180 days, 270 and 360. So. For the extra credit, you can kill all the bugs that are 270 days old. And it's all I have for, for a moment. So enjoy your afternoon. And thank you so much again for uh, for release that didn't have as many bug, bugs as before. Great job, everyone. And thank you. Thank you, Anton. Um, the ones that say none at the bottom of this list, will you start? Um... It, so will you take is, a look at those or take care of yeah, those? Uh, yeah, I will take a look at those. This is, uh, it means that those bugs are do, not assigned to any teams. So, right. Teams, so. Okay. And I'll I think there are some test, automated test um, stories or features that are not linked up to the epics that are tracking those. Um, so, I just put a reminder in chat if 
if you don't know what epics they should be linked to, check in with Anton, he can uh, help you get that sorted out. The other thing that I know I'm really looking forward to that I don't think we're gonna be able to accomplish for Foliget in um, Kiwi is, uh, but I hope we will in Lotus, is that as we start to do more end-to-end -end UI tests, uh, as we start to automate more of those, we're gonna be able to retire some of the really old basic manual tests that we have in test reel. And so it's gonna cut down on the, oh my gosh, do I seriously have to test if I can create a, a match profile for the you know, 15th time and for the fourth or fifth or sixth bug fest. So that will be really nice too for all of the manual testers that put in so much work during the bug fest. So right now the plan is to automate 172 manual test cases across all the modules. So within the test trail test plan, there are different test groups and tests assigned to the smoke test groups group uh, will be automated and then they can be removed from, um, then they can be uh, removed from the uh, manual, manual test plan. And in addition to that, though, uh, we're planning to run those tests on a daily basis. So there will be daily Jenkins job that will execute those test cases. So uh, the idea is that we have daily feedback and so that uh, during the development cycle, not just uh, at the end of the release when we're trying to execute it during the bug fest. And that should also help us to uh, identify uh, new problems sooner. Right. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, I um, have stolen the screen again just for a couple minutes here at the end. We are going to have our next um, sprint review after sprint 123. I can't believe it, but we are already starting to get into end of release uh, prep work in the current sprint 122. Um, the sprint calendar, which has all of these deadlines, there's a link in the slide deck. It's on the wiki. Um, there's a really good uh, page of Kiwi uh, release details. And uh, we will start, I think we've actually started the release notes. I'm sure they will continue to grow. That said, we still have a little bit of Juniper, the hotfix for that. And I think we even have a couple Iris release notes we're gonna still need to update. So API freeze is coming up. We're starting to get into, um, pre-releases, making sure that our schema upgrades work um, ever, always more and more critical as we have more live libraries. And like I said, link to the sprint calendar. And of course we have the link to the Kiwi release on the wiki. And past that we have um, the plans for the uh, coming Next couple sprints, uh, there is work going on with optimistic blocking and making sure that what the um, inventory is implementing or has implemented will not trigger issues in other apps that inventory interacts with. Um, there is the never ending testing work um, and so on and so forth. So I think that is it for today. Um, any questions that folks want to ask or, um, oh, oh, these were at the end, these were Anton's, sorry. Um, any questions that anybody wants to ask? And if specifics uh, pop into the SIG channel or to the dev team channel or, um, uh, get a hold of the individual person that you had questions for. Um, thank you for all the presenters. Really nice work that folks showed and looking forward to the next one. Oops, and there's one more chat here. Thank you, Kalila. All right, so everybody gets eight minutes back for everybody that's at um, dinner time in your time zone. Go have a lovely dinner and the rest of us will have a good afternoon.
Thanks very much. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thanks, everybody. Bye. -bye. Okay, goodbye.